from HanselMinutes.com. It's Hansel Minutes, a weekly discussion with web developer and technologist Scott Hanselman. This is Lawrence Ryan announcing show number 260, recorded live Thursday, March 31st, 2011. Support for Hansel Minutes is provided by Telerik RAD Controls, the most comprehensive suite of components for Windows Forms and ASP.NET web applications. Online at www.telerik.com. In this episode, Scott talks with Jonathan Carter about optimizing APIs. Hi, this is Scott Hanselman, and this is another episode of Hansel Minutes. Today I'm talking to Jonathan Carter. How's it going, JC? It's going great, Scott. Thanks for having me. My pleasure. It's always always fun to hang out with you. Jonathan has worked with me on a whole pile of presentations. We've presented together all over the place, all over the world, and we've put demos together, and we've uh, panicked about presentations going well. We've had lots of fun. Oh, yeah. Panicking is always fun when it's with you. Yeah. <laughs> Panicking is what I do best. Because it's um, epic and over the top, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And uh, we've been working on some stuff for the uh, for the keynote at Mix. And when we uh, when we're building keynote demos, there is inevitably uh, additional supporting stuff that's not the point of the keynote. It's just kind of like supporting code or you know helper functions that'll make the presentation go a little bit better. And one of the things that uh, that Jonathan was working on was a kind of a clean, lightweight way to make an RSS feed. And uh, he's kind of, you know, kind of exploring this uh, this space. There's lots of different ways to to do an RSS feed for an application, for whether it be for a demo or for real life. You could potentially just make an uh, a view in your MVC page or maybe your Razor page that looks like RSS and put a for loop in there, and then you just have to decide what fields you want to output. But that typically breaks down when you start getting into more complicated feeds, things like like media data and iTunes um, extensions to RSS, and then add them. Another way to do it would be to uh, do things in the code behind and use all of the syndication feed stuff that's built into the .NET framework. There's actually a whole series of classes that are built into the .NET framework. But but Jonathan, for this little bit of supporting code to make an RSS uh, feed, you did something kind of different that I, I didn't expect. Ex- explain what you did and why it's a little different. Um, well, so I guess as a bit of context, like I, I've spent a lot of the last year of my life working kind of in the web API and web services space. And so typically when I think of functionality or behavior, I like to think of it as this service that your application can just take advantage of instead of having to, you know, have too much code spit or, or assets within your application that you have to manage yourself, um, and so, as, as you mentioned, when we started thinking about, like, hey, how could you have a cool NuGet package for getting RSS and Atom into your application on top of some arbitrary data, um, you know, I started trying to think about how to leverage new features within ASP.NET, um, as well as language features within C Sharp that I could take advantage of to, to make that kind of an intuitive, uh, hopefully, and then expressive um, and so one of the great things is because of the fact that ASP.NET routing uh, is very easy to use and very pluggable, you know, I started thinking to myself, okay, well, really, you know, if you want an RSS feed, an Atom feed, instead of having uh, just static files in your page that include the, the markup for, for doing those syndication feeds, why not just have routes that can, be, uh, that can respond to users' requests for that data uh, and then, and then you don't have to have that code in your actual app. Um, but then the problem is, is well, how do you configure that? How does the routes know what data to actually serve, and, and so forth and so on? So, I, I started taking a look at, and I've been really inspired by some of the web helpers that the ASP.NET team has been doing, like WebGrid and, and, and Web Security and so forth, where they kind of favor this model of doing a, a bit of light initialization, maybe on pre-app start. Um, and then having, you know, methods that favor long kind of parameter signatures with a lot of optionals, and and uh, but you can be very expressive and very flexible as much as you want. Um, and so I thought, wouldn't it be great is if you could, within an application, pull down a NuGet package and have one line of code 
that specifies your title, your description of your feed, and then uh, a lambda to specify where your data comes from, and then a lambda to map your data, whatever the type is, to uh, a model that is used to express how a, a feed looks in, a, in an RSS or Atom uh, syndication feed. Um, that way it's pretty lightweight, um, but also pretty flexible if you really need it to be. Um, and, and it's worked out so far, um, and, and hopefully people like it. Yeah, it's 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 really interesting. It sounds, uh, of course, it's always funny to talk about code on a podcast, but yeah. it's interesting to look at this particular chunk of code, and we'll, we'll certainly we'll put this up. Uh, you're going to release it on NuGet, and you'll blog about it as well. Yep. Listeners will be able to check it out. But I think what's interesting is that if you think about the um, what's involved in making an RSS feed, it's deceptively simple, but mm-hmm. it gets really complex really fast. And you've got the, the, like you said, the hooking up of the routes. Where is the URL going to be? Yep. Where is the data going to come from? How is the data going to change? Because there's a transformation. Typically, what you've got in your database or your database context is not going to look anything like RSS. So you want to yep. be able to pick and choose from fields. You want to say, I want this field, I want that field, etc. And possibly do a small transformation while you're doing it, maybe to uppercase or lowercase or snipping something off or something so there's yeah. there's the where is it coming from there's the transformation and then NuGet brings in the uh the drop in ability it's not quite a component story but the idea that the user has re- has gotten your code very quickly but they want to get results very quickly too so you're almost kind of designing your api for the assumption that this has been dropped in and they're going to look at it they want to change a few things and then run don't yeah, totally. It's it's funny because I was just having a conversation with a, a colleague the other day, and you know, in the handful of libraries that I'm working on right now, um, the the syndication feed being one of them, I'm definitely very explicit about NuGet being that distribution model, which um, does modify kind of the way you think about designing the API um, and giving you additional tools, kind of so to speak, to think about how to you know get that extra line of code out of there or make it that much more simpler for the consumer, mm-hmm. which is pretty nice, um, you know, because certainly I'm a freak when it comes to simplicity when designing APIs, uh, and, and you're always trying to achieve that holy grail of one line of code. Uh, but, but yeah, definitely NuGet really does help a lot to make it simpler for folks. Some of these new APIs, though, that have come out in the, in the C-sharp and VB space lately uh, look so foreign. I've heard a lot of people feel that they, they, uh, there's a, there's a saying that someone moved my cheese. You know, you look at, a, you look at an API like the web grid, uh, yeah. that you use in Razor. And you say, wow, that just doesn't look like anything I've ever seen. And what's ironic is that people are saying that it doesn't look like what they're used to, but what they're used to is a, a constructor that takes like seven strings. So they'll, mm-hmm. you know, they'll say, my new something. String, comma, string, comma, string, comma, int, comma, string, comma, string. You know? And yeah. in the new style of, 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 uh, development, and I don't know if this is a style yet. I think that's what we're exploring. With something like WebGrid, you're using named parameters. So you might have a dozen or more parameters, but many of them have appropriate defaults. So with WebGrid, you might say something like var grid equals new WebGrid. And then your parameters would th- have things like can sort colon false comma rows per page colon 10 and uh that that makes for a very interesting looking looking api when you're using name parameters but then things get crazy when you start chaining kind of jquery style and you say dot bind so you've really got two lines of code suddenly all on one line and then inevitably people break that up onto multiple lines so you could end up with uh a lot of code and a lot of moving parts in uh, effectively one line of code. W- where is that yeah. coming from? Why are we chaining things? Is it jQuery that's causing us to chain things together, or is it the introduction of lambdas and and uh, in C sharp? You know, it's interesting that you say that because I mean, I, I obviously can't speak on any authority, but I think that jQuery might be very responsible for that because you know, method chaining as a pattern has been around for a long time. But, yeah, it never really became commonplace that I know 
uh, certainly in, in APIs until jQuery really embraced that idea of, you know, let's get as much functionality on, quote-unquote, one line of code as possible, um, which I think is awesome and personally is an, an intuitive style for myself. But, yeah, you do struggle, uh, certainly when you're designing your own API, to to kind of assume or hope that folks consuming your your library uh, find the same kind of style to be intuitive, um, which is where things get a bit problematic because, yeah, you do have to choose between do you want to be opinionated or do you want to be very flexible. Um, but I, I definitely do think, as I mentioned, because of the fact that you know jQuery is extremely popular and taken off, uh, I have to believe that, that people are, are getting adapted to that method chaining kind of uh, flowing of of uh, method calls style, they're getting pretty p- familiar with this to where API designers can start taking advantage of it and feeling confident that they're not going to add an additional concept count to their users that, that causes it to be un- unwieldy to use. Isn't there a barrier, kind of a barrier to entry? Like as the more fluent and the more chain you make your API, aren't you cutting down the number of people that are either going to be able to understand it or be willing to to understand it. I mean, I've seen some pretty crazy fluent APIs that say things like, you know, my object dot is dot something <laughs> dot, you know, it's like, well, really, are we, are we yeah. seriously going in that direction? We're going to build sentences and that feels okay because no one will decide. No one can decide like, what is the is object? Maybe this is just <laughs> me being old and, and an old crusty guy with a beard, but, uh, how you know no, how far I, do you take something like this? Yeah, no, I definitely agree, and I I think a lot of folks that have strong opinions around fluent interfaces agree that you don't want to try to be creating an English language if you do that kind of API. Um, you know, there's definitely a nice flow that you can create in the chain of methods, but yeah, when you get to the point where you're doing methods called is or do, you know, you're you're almost getting a little bit way too far on the deep end. Um, and I personally don't like that style. Um, another thing that I that I've always be kind of been a fan of is, you know, the notion of a fluent interface really being kind of like a UI on top of an API. And so, mm. you know, a lot of a lot of times I've seen where, you know, folks optimize for the fluent interface, and that is really the only kind of way to interact with a with a library. And that's great if you happen to subscribe to the same style or thinking that that, inter- that fluent interface was designed in. But if you don't, then you're kind of, you know, a little bit out of luck and that there's no way to fall back to a more general purpose, kind of simpler way to inter- interface with the library. Um, whereas a lot of folks, and kind of a pattern that I personally like is where you have an underlying kind of quote-unquote canonical interface that is uses kind of traditional familiar patterns, you know, tries to use as little generics as possible, um, doesn't go lambda crazy, doesn't require method chaining and very cryptic, you know, uh, patterns that, that are getting more and more common. And then on top of that, you layer, you know, your more kind of ambitious or, or radical things like you just have lambdas everywhere and generics out the wazoo. Maybe you're using gene- uh, some dynamic stuff. Um, and to me, that feels really good. Um, and once again, going back to the, the web API metaphor, you know, I almost kind of look at your library, the core library, as an API. And then in the same way that you know, different users of Twitter like different experiences on top of that service, mm-hmm. um, a fluent interface is really just another way to create a different experience of that underlying library. Uh, some people are going to like it. Some people aren't. And so that's why I, you know, I, I like to say that you should be as ambitious as you want because, yeah, that, that, that interface or that uh, programming model that allows me to be very expressive with my lambdas and, and do all kinds of stuff like name parameters and give me tons of optionals and let me do chaining and for me, that's great, but for someone else, that's not going to be. Um, and so kind of having that flexibility and giving people options, uh, I think, is definitely a pretty nice pattern to go with. Hi, this is Scott coming to you from another place in time. 
Are you using agile practices to manage your software development? There's lots of tools on the market that manage the steps of a project, but most of them focus on individual roles. Get ready for a solution that caters for the success of the whole team. The guys at Telerik introduced Team Pulse. It's an agile project management tool that will help you gather ideas, estimate, plan, track progress in a common workspace. Finally, companies, regardless of their size, can use a lightweight and convenient tool that makes all the stakeholders work as a united team, even if they're in different countries. By combining intuitive user interface and the power of Serverlight, Team Pulse removes the roadblocks that you typically face and applying Agile in an effective manner. No more lost data, no disparate systems, no lack of critical analytics regarding the health and velocity of your project. See for yourself, get a free copy for five users and one project at Telerik.com slash Team Pulse. And please do thank Telerik for supporting Hansel Minutes on their Facebook fan page, facebook.com slash T-E-L. E-R-I-K, Telerik. We do appreciate it. There wouldn't be a Hansel Minutes if there wasn't Telerik helping us. I like that. I, I think that, that really resonated with me that you said that it was a, a kind of a UI. I mean, it's it's like it's like the API might be the command line and the Fluent API might be the GUI. And yeah. you want to give the person the flexibility to do both. And you may not have complete fidelity in the UI. There may be stuff you need to drop down to. Yep. But like, for example, I'm looking at, uh, some code right now that will, will, will include a link on the show notes where we register a data feed and we basically say, uh, all of my, all of my data is here and here's how it maps and here's some additional fields. And it's, it's like 23 lines of code, 24 lines of code. Mm -hmm. It's actually one line. Yep. It's like data feeds dot register. And then there's 24 lines of very ni nicely, cleanly indented code. And then this, and, and I, could this as it is be done not in one line? Could I, I mean, have you designed this that same way where there's the fluent API and then there's the underlying stuff? Yeah. So, I mean, it could definitely probably be much better. Um, but there is an overload of the function that it doesn't use generics, um, and also doesn't, uh, enforce lambdas within the kind of, the same context as the method call, so you can pass the kind of all-encompassing feed settings or aggregate object that contains all of your settings, and, you know, that allows people that if they want to feel like they're being a little bit more imperative um, or pulling values from some external data source and, uh, mm -hmm. and they want to do it that way, um, they can. Some of the things that uh, the people who are listening may or may not be familiar with, because uh, very you know everyone has a different level of of uh, of, of code and ability and a familiarity with the system that uh, that varies. But you've got some some i enumerable of t, right? Which means that yep. you're going to spin over something or spin through some data. But yep. then you've got some uh, func, <laughs> f u n c. So, for example, uh, one of the one of the parameters that you take in, you've got a func that's a generic of context and i enumerable of some entity. So, th at some point, there are programmers that that will struggle with that level of of genericness or indirection. C can you talk about yeah. what a func is and how and why you would need a func of t context of i enumerable of t entity and why that's so powerful and why it's something that folks should learn. Yeah. Yeah, so a long time ago back in the, you know, uh, .NET 1 and 1.1 one, one days and uh, 2 days, I forget exactly the version of the .NET framework that Funk and Action were introduced in, but mm -hmm. you know, people uh, at some point would want to introduce, like you said, indirection such that uh, a function would take a delegate and a delegate just being a, either a pointer to another method or kind of a um, an aggregation of code that you can pass to another function to execute um, such that it, it can allow itself to be kind of a bit dynamic of what it does. Um, and, and the problem was is delegates, people were creating one for everything. So you would say, okay, I need a, a method signature that takes an integer and returns a Boolean or takes two Booleans and returns a string. And so you ended up having this explosion of delegates um, that people were creating. And so when, when Funk and, and also Action were introduced, it was effectively saying, hey, we realize that people are using this pattern a lot where they need a delegate that either just takes a series of parameters and returns nothing, 
which is where action is used. And action is just a delegate that, that allows you to specify different, uh, what types of parameters the, the function will take and that it doesn't return anything. And then func is, is a delegate that is generic and allows you to specify, uh, I take these number of parameters of this type and then I return this type of parameter. Um, and so in the case of the, the kind of syndication feed registration method you just mentioned, where you have a parameter that's of type func, uh, context, comma, I enumerable, um, what that's saying is, is that that represents a method or a block of executable code, such as mm-hmm. a lambda, that will take a context parameter, um, whatever that might be, and that's a generic type, uh, that we were talking about, and then it'll return an I enumerable. So this this block of code or this method is responsible for responding with a, a list of data that it can um, optionally r- retrieve from this context type that is being given. Okay, and it definitely so... is a little bit hard to to get to know. I know uh, a lot of times, you know, when I for the last few years, really, um, certainly at Microsoft, whenever we would, you know, try to produce simple APIs or, or guidance for folks, we were always very weary of using generics, um, not because we didn't think people could understand it, um, but just you wanted things to be as simple as possible. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and generics is, of course, another concept thing that you need to, to grasp and understand. Um, and so when you kind of add on top of that uh, generic delegates, and then Lambda expressions, um, yeah, things can get a little bit hairy quickly. Um, but, you know, I'm hoping to take the stance of being a bit opinionated and, you know, thinking that people will like the expression, uh, expressiveness that you can have with those type of concepts and, and language features mm-hmm. and will hopefully embrace them. Um, but if they don't, then, you know, make sure to provide them with a more simpler version of the API as well. Yeah, there's there's definitely a a level that one could take it in designing an API like this that would be almost too much. It would just it would be kind of uh, if if one could call an API obnoxious, one could go too far and have <laughs> yeah, just you know, funk a funk a funk a funk, and it's just like really come on. But oh, but at yeah. the same time, with with something like this, where you're basically you you need to pass a chunk of functionality. You know, into your, in, into your API. And kind of in the old days, you would say, well, I'll take something of a, of a certain interface. Yep. So you, you might have said, I want to register and, hey, you know that thing that's going to provide me and my feeds, all my data? We'll have an iFeed provider thingy. And then you'll go and you'd make some interface. And then the idea would be that the user would implement that interface. They'd have to go make a custom class. And then they'd have an iFeed provider mapper object thingy. And then they'd pass that in. But the funk, it's like a generic way of saying, you give me one of these and I'll give you one of those. And then the provider can, can literally just be a lambda. And like you said, a lambda is like a little script block almost. It's like a C sharp or VB script block, it says, here's the little bit of mapping, or here's a little bit of work I want you to do. And and it, it I think, and I, I've had this conversation with Rob Connery, I think it makes .NET more fun and feel more, feel more dynamic. Uh, I think it's funny that that uh, Ruby guys and you know they they take all this stuff for granted because they're they're throwing these kinds of constructs around all the time. I think that uh, .NET programmers. Uh, we, we kind of need to raise our game, don't you think? We need to start familiarizing yep. our stuff with this. Yeah, it's it, it's funny because, like, I, you know, obviously I'm, as people are starting to notice, JavaScript is just exploding and, you know, now with Node.js and it's, you know, people are wanting to use it on the server and the client. But, mm-hmm. and I love JavaScript as much as everyone else because it's a very expressive language. But, but, yeah, in many cases, C-sharp lambdas, can actually be much more expressive and uh, and uh, compact than what you could even do with anonymous functions in JavaScript. So yeah, like you say, when I when I write or use an API that's kind of lambda, uh, I don't want to say lambda heavy in that it's just completely over the top and unnecessary, but it mm-hmm. makes use of lambdas where applicable. It does feel very 
fun because it's kind of like scripting or man, you're just, it, it feels like it's fluid as you're writing the code. You're kind of from one parameter to the next. Certainly if you have, you know, a method call or an object where lambdas can interact with each other, um, which can get a bit weird. Um, but mm-hmm. once you grasp that concept, uh, it does start to feel very dynamic and very fluid, uh, and it can, you know, make it more joyous, you know, if that even doesn't sound ridiculous, to, to use the API or even to write it. No, it, it doesn't. It's funny that you say that. Uh, you know, Rob and I have been talking about this, and I've been, this has kind of been a little mini crusade of mine internally about if we, we always, we at Microsoft are always focused on product, programmer productivity. Yep. And if we would spend more time focusing on programmer joy, yeah. programmer productivity would fall out of that. I mean, you know, me and Rob, I keep bringing up Rob because I think of Rob Connery as being someone who is very joy, joy focused, right? Here's a guy who lives in, yep. in Hawaii. Right? Yeah. <laughs> you know, he could live anywhere. He lives in Hawaii because he is optimizing for surfing. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> yeah. uh, he, he and I did a show a couple of, a uh, m- month or two ago on, on web matrix. And we kind of proposed the idea that web matrix wasn't necessarily for, who the marketing people said it was for, right? The marketing people say that it's for like these, 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 they call them the breadth developer, right? It's the, it's the Mm -hmm. young kids and the hobbyists. And we, we proposed that it's probably also for the crusty old programmer who wants to optimize for fun. And we went and we wrote the, this developer's life website in, in Razor and in web matrix because it was more fun. And, uh, I, when I started using your, your data feeds API and exploring that, I just said, well, this is fun. It gets out of the way. It, it's a difficult thing to, to describe why one API would have joy and another one would not. But, uh, I don't know. It's a break from the tedium to get so much done in so few lines of code. And, uh, uh, I think that the .NET community, the open source community, and Microsoft themselves really need to take a cue from the Ruby folks and from the Python folks and from some of the academics that are really looking for expressiveness in their uh, yeah. in their language design. And and again, productivity almost doesn't need to be optimized for as much anymore. Yeah, yeah, I, I definitely agree on the productivity point. I remember, you know, one of the the things that really was a stark reality to me was uh, seeing how successful iPhone development and Facebook development was when, for the longest time, the Facebook platform was, the documentation was horrible, and it was a very crusty API, um, and very much the same way with iPhone development. But the thing was is that those two platforms had a great ecosystem that was very fun to develop and very satisfying um, and so, yeah, I, I kind of realized that productivity should not be the, the first kind of the high order bit in that, that kind of scenario. You definitely want to, if you can do it, great. Um, but it's funny that you mentioned the thing about web matrix because I actually, I've been working on another project that I, that's called Mercury. And when I first started it, um, it was going to have some web components to it. And I originally was going to use MVC just because that's what I've been using for years. But I kind of decided that I wanted to give ASP.NET web pages a try. And, you know, I I liked Razor in the context of MVC, but I also, you know, used to work in uh, a PHP shop before kind of embracing the .NET world. And I wanted to see what it felt like to get back to inline pages and, you know, keeping things very simple and not feeling like I have to architect an entire pipeline for every form. Um, And I've actually been loving it. And so it, I totally agree that it's interesting that web matrix and uh, ASP.NET web pages has been targeted towards kind of the, the breadth hobbyist um, when I'm using Visual Studio 2010 Ultimate and doing quote unquote pro development. Uh, and I find it to be a great experience. Um, and, and there's so much in the web pages runtime even that is, that is really awesome. Um, so like, being able to use what they call application parts and being able to extend the administrative uh, portal, you know, which opens up a whole new uh, uh, option of scenarios for developers where 
if you want your NuGet package to have a visual aspect to it or a configuration, you know, why not extend the web pages admin portal uh, and bootstrap that in your application? And just all these new and interesting ways to think about as a as a library or API designer, you know, how can you take advantage of the most simplest and the quote unquote funnest environment and options for your end users? Um, and it's you know always a challenge and a constant struggle to find that, but but there is definitely some aesthetic. It, it's almost like you know all these designers and with mix coming up, you know people that spend hours and hours and hours thinking about the psychology of color and button placement to create the the most possible and best user experience. Um, you know it's almost like as designers and library creators and open source. Uh, developers and so forth, we should be doing UX for our client base as well. But instead of being end users, it's other developers, you know, because how do you, how do you emit that psychological factor that people use your product and just love it? You know, how do you determine the aesthetics of what good is and what fun is in the context of code, um, and it's really hard to do other than observing people and giving things a try, um, you know, where, but not being too radical. You know, you don't want to start making APIs where only like two people in the world could ever consume it and, and they think it's fun purely because they're megalomaniacs. Um, you know, you want it to be fun for, for everybody or at least for, for most people. So, so yeah, a- API design is definitely an amazing and interesting space. Um, both from the kind of web API at the internet web scale, um, and then also within libraries uh, too, just because you're trying to make assumptions about how people work that you can only assume is how they work. Mm -hmm. Um, And so it's kind of satisfying as an API designer to be proven that it's right. You know, I, I was watching this TED session and this is a total tangent, but I, I love TED Sessions, and I'm sure you do too, Scott. Mm-hmm. Um, but, but there was a, a woman who was talking about sp- spoken poetry and how, you know, it's scary to get into, but when you get out on stage and you speak the truth and you speak yourself and somebody in the audience clicks with you because they feel exactly the same way, it makes it so worth it and it doesn't make it scary anymore. Um, and, and it's kind of a weird analogy, but I totally feel like, you know, putting yourself out there and creating an open source project is very much the same way where it can be very scary and you're, you're not sure if the decisions you're making as far as the API design is, is the best one possible. Um, but you take a chance and there's going to be people that click with that. And, and that's a pretty cool pretty cool experience to see somebody come back and be like, oh, man, this works so great. I spun up something within two hours and went home feeling like a hero, um, you know, versus, you know, creating software that is only meant for the largest enterprise and takes seven Oracle engineers and, and nine months to get working. You know, sure, that could be successful, but nobody <laughs> nobody wants to do that. Um, so, so, yeah, it's interesting and you know, for any folks that are uh, hesitant or, you know, not not kind of getting on board with, with trying to put themselves out there and do open source software and, and share their ideas, you know, I would always encourage people to do it just because it, it is, it gives you a level of satisfaction that you, you can't otherwise get. Yeah, definitely. Definitely. I, I like the idea that we, we spend so much time having, uh, uh, you know, design committee meetings and bringing people in and asking them how this color makes them feel or that pixel makes them feel. It, it, mm-hmm. It's okay to have the same kind of an experience with an API and 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 to say, you know, I don't know why this uh, feels better. I don't know why this is a better API, but I, I know it when I see it. And mm-hmm. uh, this API makes me happier over that API, and I will have more fun writing my code this way than that code. So I, I really like the idea of having not just design reviews for frameworks and saying, you know, does this, is this correct or does this follow our rules, but, but will people have more fun doing it? 
Mm-hmm. I, I definitely appreciate that. Thanks for uh, for chatting with me today, Jonathan. I appreciate it. Yeah, thanks a lot, Scott. Well, this has been another episode of Hansel Minutes, and I'll give you links to Jonathan's blog, and you can follow him at Lost in Tangent on Twitter. See you next week. Mm-hmm.